Good afternoon and welcome to our cardiac and vascular lecture series. I am Dr. Khaled Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A features uh, located in the bottom of your screen. Our official moderator today will be Dr. Rogelio Rivas, who is our Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Alvaro Gomez, who will be presenting a lecture titled Cardio-Oncology Focused on Breast Cancer. Dr. Gomez is an interventional cardiologist who specializes in cardiovascular diseases, cardiology, oncology, heart disease, interventional cardiology, and nuclear cardiology at Baptist Health Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Dr. Gomez is a, the program director of cardiovascular care and cardiac oncology. He is board certified in the internal and in internal medicine, cardiovascular diseases and interventional cardiology and holds a certification from the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Dr. Gomez received his medical training at the University of Panama in Panama City. He completed his internship at Social Security General Hospital in Nicolás Salano Hospital in Panama, followed by a residency in internal medicine at Montreal General Hospital, McGill University in Canada. His postdoctoral training includes a clinical fellowship in cardiology at hospital, at hospitals affiliated with the McGill University, a clinical and research fellowship in nuclear cardiology at Montreal General Hospital. Dr. Gomez diagnoses and treats a wide range of cardiovascular diseases. His clinical interest includes nuclear cardiac stress testing and the prevention and management of coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and valvular heart disease. He is a Baptist Health Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute local physician champion for women's health. Uh, he specializes in diagnosing and treating a wide range of cardiovascular diseases, as well as in catheter-based procedures, such as angioplasty and stenting. Dr. Gomez has conducted numerous clinical research trials on the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular diseases, has published articles in various peer-reviewed medical journals. Dr. Gomez is fluent in English and Spanish. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Gomez, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gomez. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, I apologize for the slight delay. I really was just finishing a case right now. Um, and uh, it went a bit longer than what I was hoping for. So uh, uh, can you all see my screen well? OK, perfect. Yes. So, yes, so um, cardio-oncology is a relatively new subspecialty within the world of cardiology. And it's something that caught my attention from the outset um, because even before I became a cardiologist, I was really interested in actually being an oncologist in a totally different field. Uh, but I decided on cardiology, I'm very happy I decided on cardiology, but I always kept a, a love for the treatment of uh, you know, oncological diseases, uh, especially hematological diseases. And I always kept up to date with my chemotherapy treatments, uh, all the things that relate or pertain to oncology. Um, so when this specialty came up, you know, it was just a beautiful marriage between the two things that I really like very much. And I decided to take it over uh, immediately as it came out. And I want to focus uh, this presentation in cardio-oncology as it pertains to breast cancer, which is the cornerstone, the absolute foundation of any cardio-oncology program is the management of patients with breast cancer. And this is something that we'll be happy to help anybody that feels that needs extra help here in Miami, you know, at um, you know, uh, Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute Baptist Hospital. But these are programs that at least on a very basic level can be instituted in your own hospitals. And if you need help, We'll be glad to try to help you out doing this. And it's a great service for the local doctors that treat cancer patients in your area. So what is the basis for cardio-oncology? Why do we need this specialty at all? Well, cardio-oncology is you know, right at the intersection of three 
major issues in the cancer patients. One is that many of these patients already have cardiovascular risk factors. Many of these patients are older, they smoke, they have high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary disease, previous stents, previous bypass surgery. So right there, that presents an extra risk for any cancer therapy. Then we have, of course, the therapies themselves, many of which can be cardiotoxic, particularly in the treatment of breast cancer. Um, we have you know, therapies that are cardiotoxic also, particularly in lymphomas and leukemias. And then we have, of course, a multitude of immune therapies coming out for virtually every form of cancer. And many of them can have different degrees of cardiovascular complications. Last but not least, the cancer itself, the biology of the cancer itself can affect the heart function. You know, not only in terms of metastases, you know, thankfully the heart is very infrequently uh, the target of any metastases, but the substances sometimes generated by, by the cancer cells can affect the heart in multiple different ways. So when we have all these three things combined at the intersection, that's where cardio-oncology comes in. Now, is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem because treatments for breast cancer have improved so dramatically that after eight to nine years of the diagnosis of breast cancer, patients do not tend to die any more often of breast cancer. They die more often of cardiovascular disease. And this is very telling, almost no matter what age the diagnosis is, particularly so in the older population. You now, if you survived your breast cancer for eight to nine years, you know, yes, there are recurrences, and many times the recurrences can be worse than the initial event. But you know, by far and away, you, know, you can be considered disease free after five years. But cardiovascular disease, the spectrum continues. And not only because of aging, but also the, the additive effect of risk factors and the effect that the chemotherapy might have had on the heart muscle make cardiovascular disease then the number one cause for mortality after eight to nine years of diagnosis of breast cancer. And again, this is pretty much the, the same, uh, a different slide saying the same thing that as, you know, particularly in the age group of 70 to 80 year olds, you know, mortality for cancer in general really starts coming down, but cardiovascular disease in red continues to go up exponentially. And really at this age group, in this age group, you know, over, over 70, you can say over 75, you know, cardiovascular disease takes over as the number one cause of mortality uh, for all cancer patients. And it is known that, especially if it's a complex form of cancer that requires you know, intensive chemotherapy, or for instance, a bone marrow transplant, you know, it is a hit on the body. You know, your body is like, you know, like if you were in a car accident, okay? You will recover from the car accident after many weeks of you know, maybe surgeries and operations and et cetera, but your body is just not going to be the same. Your body will, have the, the, will always have the marks, the effects of the car accident or the cancer treatment for that matter. And it is known that especially in those complex cancer patients, life expectancy goes down by three or four years right off the bat, just when the diagnosis of cancer. Now, I'm not going to bother you with all the possible things that can happen in terms of cardiotoxicity uh, and different chemotherapy agents. As you can see, there's just many of them, okay? But I want to focus what it says anthracyclines there because the treatment of breast cancer will imply the use of anthracyclines many times. And then to the right of that, it says trastuzumab, signaling pathways. Well, that is another cornerstone of therapy for breast cancer. And both medications are, have a potential, have a potential for cardiotoxicity. And breast cancer being so common, it's a, one of the most common forms of cancer. Needless to say, then the, the, um, the incidence of cardiotoxicity in the breast cancer population tends to be higher overall, the prevalence tends to be higher overall compared to other forms of cancer, okay? 
Now, cardiotoxicity simply defined is just damage to the heart muscle by the chemotherapy medications. And this is manifested by an increase in ejection fraction. And most importantly, as a sign of early warning, a decrease in left ventricular strain. We're gonna talk about that later. Very important, this concept of strain in the management of cancer patients, but particularly breast cancer. So fundamental to the treatment of any form of breast cancer is the knowledge of the receptors. And of course, we're not gonna go into too much detail about this, but suffice it to say that breast cancers can have two different types of hormonal of, of, of receptors. One is the hormonal receptors. No, it's two different ones, estrogen and progesterone. No, that's one type of receptor. But then the other receptor is the HER2 receptor, which is very important for the management of breast cancer. So you know, if you have just estrogen, you, know, you, can, you can have an estrogen positive but HER2 negative tumor. You can have a HER2 positive and, and estrogen negative. You can have you know, triple positive tumors where all the receptors are positive. But also very important, if all the receptors are negative, if none of them is positive, then the patient will have what is commonly known as a triple negative breast cancer. And that's an important concept to know, triple negative breast cancer. Now, if your tumor is estrogen positive and HER2 negative and it's localized, well, this is probably the simplest form of breast cancer. Now, if you're gonna have a breast cancer, this is the one to have. Um, because most of the time it's treated with just local excision. You take out the tumorous um, nodule, okay? And then you give the patient hormonal blockers, basically a medication that, hormone, that, that, that block hormonal production of estrogens or block the effect of estrogens in the tumor cells. The probably the most common one is anastrozole, that's the one that's used the most right now today in this NH. Tamoxifen used to be used, uh, no, it, and it's still used many times, but anastrozole is kind of taken over. And the new kid on the block that has been used more and more often is exomestane here now. Now, these hormonal blockers, these are not chemotherapy. These are just hormonal manipulation. And they have an increased risk for hypertension, but no significant risk for cardiotoxicity. So these, these ER positive localized breast cancers you know, do, do not have a problem of cardiotoxicity and usually the heart escapes unharmed. Now, if you have estrogen positive, but it's widespread disease, it's a metastatic tumor, then you need to treat this like if it was a triple negative tumor. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But the, com the, the common treatment for this is what we call conventional chemotherapy, meaning chemotherapy is used for many, many other diseases. And the common one used for metastatic estrogen positive or triple negative tumors is what is a combination called ACT, adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, and taxol. And the A is the one that we really care about because adriamycin or doxorubicin is probably the prime example of cardiotoxic chemotherapy. This has been known for decades that adriamycin can have cardiotoxicity and produce decreased ejection fraction. And um, adriamycin is not only used for breast cancer, you know, it's probably the most common use for adriamycin, but also is used for lymphomas, leukemias, many other forms of cancer, but particularly lymphomas and leukemias. Very, very, I mean, it's fundamental for the management. So adriamycin and breast cancer, again, because the prevalence is so much higher, the prevalence of cardiotoxicity with adriamycin in the breast cancer population, in the overall cancer population is higher. Now, if you have a triple negative breast cancer, it's treated the same way, also with ACT. And again, it involves adriamycin or doxorubicin. Now, one important thing about adriamycin is that it is dose dependent. So it almost never happens after the, same, after the first dose. So usually these patients will have uh, some evaluation of the ejection fraction, usually by echocardiography uh, and at the beginning of the treatment. And then we just know they usually get four cycles of adriamycin and we wait until after the fourth cycle and we do another echocardiogram at the end. 
Uh, most patients, no, thank God, do, no, do not have in their, in their, any significant cardiotoxicity. We usually repeat another echo six to 12 months after the termination of adriamycin, just to confirm that absolutely there was no cardiotoxicity. Now, what about that HER2 receptor? Well, this, this, is, uh, this changed completely how breast, managed, you know, breast cancer is managed. It, it really revolutionized the treatment for breast cancer because this HER2 receptor, the tumors tend to be a bit more aggressive, tend to, be, to almost always be spread, spread out, metastatic. But the HER2 receptor gives a specific target something specific to the breast cancer cells that we can target directly with medications to treat it and hopefully eradicate the tumor. The, pine, the prime example of you know, targeted therapy for HER2 receptor is Herceptin or Trastuzumab. It's been used for decades already and its first cousin is Pergeta or Pertuzumab. But Herceptin is like the one example, the one that probably you probably have heard before, because it's been used for quite a while. Pergeta is more recent. And they both are used in combination uh, in a treatment that is called, you no, know, the, the letters are TCHP. Um, you know, for Taxotere, Carboplatin, Herceptin, and Pergeta. But let's just concentrate on Herceptin and Pergeta because the other ones are not cardiotoxic. So the Herceptin or Trastuzumab cardiotoxicity is different. It's not dose dependent. It can happen after the first dose. So therefore, as they go along with the treatment, uh, we do echoes continuously throughout the treatment. So it's different. The, the protocol is different than adriamycin. And we just do one at the beginning, one at the end. With Herceptin, we do echoes do, throughout the treatment. And it gets even longer because after they have finished the TCHP, the four medications as the initial management, usually it takes 12 cycles of that. It's not uncommon at all nowadays that they stay on a long-standing Herceptin uh, treatment or multiple additional cycles of Herceptin. So throughout all this time, we need to monitor the patients with echocardiograms. Now, Thankfully, you know, unlike adriamycin, where the cardiotoxicity tends to be a bit more permanent, with Herceptin, the cardiotoxicity tends to be reversible. And if it's adequately treated, you know, the usual way with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, um, Sacubitril nowadays, usually it resolves completely and the patients can be re-challenged. They can be restarted on Herceptin if need be for the treatment of their breast cancer. Now, I'm just gonna briefly mention immunotherapy. Like I mentioned, really almost every month there is a new immunotherapy agent uh, in the market. Sorry about the misspelling of immunotherapy, I just realized that now. Uh, but depending on the receptor um, expression of the tumor, you can have different types of immunotherapy Please don't remotely try to remember these names. They're very sophisticated. It's very sophisticated. Second stage of treatment uh, um, oncology for breast cancer. But the important thing is that most of those immunotherapies are, um, do not produce significant cardiotoxicity. However, they do have a significant increase in thrombotic complications, um, like of course, DVTs and pulmonary embolization. So we always keep an eye on these treatments. Um, Kitruda, you probably recognize because it's widely advertised for lung cancer. It's the main use of Kitruda is lung cancer. But it's also used for other types of tumors, usually in a secondary or almost palliative stage. And that includes breast cancer, renal cancer is another one. Um, and again, there the main risk is thrombotic complications. Echocardiography is, again, the cornerstone of the follow-up of these patients. And basically, you cannot practice cardio-oncology without a very good, experienced, and well-organized echocardiography lab. Thankfully, we have a fantastic echo lab here at Baptist and in our diagnostic center, part of MCBI Cardiology, 
Um, we have superb technicians and really the latest in te technology for ultrasound of the heart. And it's the main tool for diagnosis and follow-up. We almost everybody, I would say 95% of the patients with breast cancer are followed with echocardiograms. A very small major, minority of these patients, I would say 5% or even less, are followed in the old fashioned way of radionuclide ventriculograms or people know as MUGA scans. But obviously that carries the extra radiation that patients don't, do not need any further. And we only do it in those patients that have had recent surgery where the ultrasound probe basically cannot be pressed against the chest because it's just too painful. And then those patients will have a MAGA scan. And like I mentioned, serial echoes are required and you want an ejection fraction over 55%. I'm not gonna bore you with the details of what an echocardiogram is. You probably have seen many, but no, we can, no. Nowadays, the, the machines have, no, are basically almost high definition and we can really see the ventricle and the ejection fraction. The, the calculation is automated many times. Uh, like this one, for instance, this is the echocardiogram. And the echocardiogram traces down the left ventricle uh, in systole and diastole. You know, and basically we have a three-dimensional three image of the left ventricle and it automatically calculates Okay. Now, um, and, and this three-dimensional ejection fraction is the most reliable form of um, estimation of the ejection fraction by echocardiography. It can be followed up uh, in a more uh, reliable way. Now, uh, many of these patients will require contrast echocardiography uh, when there are, you know, the, the chest wall is too large or something breast size is too large. And uh, the agent that we inject intravenously is called Definity. And basically it gives us a much better view of the left ventricle, as opposed to the previous image, images that I've shown. This is a severely depressed ejection fraction. Just eyeballing it, I would say it's about 20, 25%. The ventricle is moving much more weaker in this one compared to the other ones. And you know, again, the contrast echo is fundamental because again, a really accurate estimation of ejection fraction is absolutely necessary for these patients. Now, strain, how about strain? Strain is absolutely a fantastic tool that we have. It's relatively new in the world of ultrasound, but you can see it as an early warning system. No, the strain, basically when the heart contracts, the myocardial cells are under strain. They basically twist and turn, you know, so that the, the heart doesn't just contract you know, in and out, in and out. It, it, it is a forceful twisting of the myocardial fibrils uh, that produces a final contraction. What we see as a contraction normal, but it's actually multiple, of course, uh, fibers contracting in different directions. And that produces strain that if you have a high definition ultrasound machine, it can be tracked down with Doppler. And therefore we can measure how much effort, how much strain is this heart making in, uh, in every heartbeat, okay? And it's an early market of toxicity because strain will go down, will become abnormal before the ejection fraction goes down. So this is a fantastic tool. So we can have patients where are doing echo serially and the ejection fraction remains normal, 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 but we can see that the strain begins to go down. And these are negative numbers. The more negative it is, the more normal, the better, the stronger the heart is. So usually you want your numbers to be in the minus 20 something range, okay? Normal would be anything below minus 17. But if we do echoes and the strain goes minus 20, minus 17, the next one is minus 13. Even if the ejection fraction is normal, you really wanna keep a close eye on that patient, meaning that we're gonna do the echoes more frequently. We're gonna make sure the blood pressure is super well controlled. We're gonna make sure that all the risk factors are well controlled. So it's an early warning system, which is fantastic. 
again, this is how we measure it. Now, if you see there are three images of the left ventricle up there, and that would be the images beating. And the system traces down you know, the, the, the myocardium throughout you know, systole and diastole. And you can see all the little numbers popping in and out. You know, basically, it, it's calculating the strain in different heart segments. At the end, it gives you a polar map like to your lower left there. And you want to see it all red, meaning that the strain in all the segments is normal. And in this patient, for instance, the average, the very last number to the right is minus 21.7, which is normal. So this is a strong heart that is not, not only has a good ejection fraction, but the strain is not within the normal range. So is in excellent shape. And these are numbers we really want to follow. This is useful for virtually every chemotherapy, but particularly so for trastuzumab, for Herceptin. Uh, the, the strain is very, very sensitive to as an early warning system for Herceptin cardiotoxicity. So very useful number. Now, uh, I, I, let me just mention, sorry, before I go uh, into this, that strain is also used for many other diseases. It's used also for diastolic dysfunction. It's used for amyloidosis. Amyloidosis has a, has a very specific pattern of strain. So it can be used for many other things. So very useful to have it in your ultrasound machine there. Now, how do we prevent cardiotoxicity? Well, sadly, there's not that many things. Um, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers have been tried, the, users, the ones that we usually use for uh, heart failure, and results have been variable. Some, in some small studies, it works. In some larger studies, it doesn't work. So the jury's out on those. The answer is probably they don't work. Now, there's a lot of hope with sacubitril by certain combination, what here in the US is called Entresto. I know in um, the Caribbean and Latin America has many other different names, but sacubitril being the most important component there. Um, this, the studies are ongoing and the word is that it's showing a lot of promise. So this would be fantastic if we, we could have a medication that would help us prevent the cardiotoxicity. Now, if the patient has risk factors, then the more reason to treat it with these medications, if the patient has high blood pressure, the patient has diabetes, you wanna be very aggressive in the treatment of those risk factors to prevent cardiotoxicity. But the one thing that I actually has shown in multiple studies that prevents cardiotoxicity is continued and maintained physical activity. We emphasize in all these cancer patients that they really need to try to stay active. And of course, sometimes it's very hard because sometimes the chemotherapy can be very strong and all they wanna do is just sleep. But yeah, increased physical activity is absolutely crucial to prevent um, cardiotoxicity and it's been seen in many studies. The treatment of the cardiotoxicity will be the treatment of any other form of heart failure. And the four columns of heart failure in 2021 will include, of course, the sacubitril valsartan combination um, in Tresto in the US. This combination to me is really one of the best things that has happened in the world, not only cardiology, but in the world of medicine in the last 25 years, in my opinion. Beta blockers, particularly metoprolosuccinate or carvedilol, are very useful for cardiotoxicity or any other form of cardiomyopathy. The SEL2 inhibitors, medications initially used for diabetes that now are used um, in the management of heart failure, and they have shown fantastic results in mortality reduction. The two main ones are Jardians and Farsiga that we use, at least here in the US, and of course, uh, mineral corticoid inhibitors like spironolactone. Just a little word about radiation. You no, know, especially if the patient has had radiation for breast in the left breast. In the old days, 80s and 90s, where radiation was a bit less controlled than what it is now, this has advanced tremendously. But it, we see cases you now every now and then of radiation-induced coronary artery disease and aortic stenosis, and this is you not know, rare, but it's seen sometimes. Um, it's seen actually much more commonly in lymphoma patients that were heart radiation in the 80s, the lymphoma beam goes right through the heart for the mediastinal radiation, or especially for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we're seeing those patients now, they are in their 60s, 70s with severe coronary disease. And sometimes I have one case 
of severe aortic stenosis re related to the radiation has a very specific ultrasound pattern. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, you have the number there for Baptist International for any needs that we, we may have in terms of the management of cardio oncology patients, or to, for that matter, any other cardiology question that you may have, we're here to help you out as our partners in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, I guess the forum will be open for questions now. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for such an insightful presentation. I'm sure we will get some questions uh, for you to answer for us. Uh, please remember to post your questions in the Q&A session in the bottom of your screen, um, center screen at the bottom. Uh, please type your questions and we'll make sure to answer those. Dr. Rivas will be our official moderator this afternoon. So uh, let's kick off uh, the questions, Dr. Rivas. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I can't imagine how patients, this is possibly on a patient that would have a normal heart, right? And then unfortunately has to go through cancer therapy and then um, has to under, undergo these strains or these uh, wounds later on that, that, that are occurring in, in the heart. But those patients that already had a heart condition, uh, whether it's CAD, what is what have you seen as the uh, how this uh, this progresses? Those that have had plaques in the coronary arteries, et cetera, et cetera. How have you seen uh, the treatment and the oncological treatments affecting that, if any? Well, the, these patients. Um... The, um, you know, first of all, every patient that is, uh, has a previous history of heart disease, uh, right off the bat is considered high risk. So all those patients are high risk patients. If they have had coronary disease, for instance, uh, most of those patients will require a stress test, a nuclear stress test before the initiation of chemotherapy. Um, and if they have had a previous cardiomyopathy, you know, right off the bat, if the ejection fraction is below 50%, that precludes the use of adriamycin and herceptin and or perceptin or pergetta for that matter. So they need to go into different combinations that don't include these therapies. And, you know, obviously if you're using cardiotoxic medications for decades, it's because that combi the combination that uses adriamycin or, her or herceptin for HER2 positive tumors, they work, you know, it's a highly effective combination. So if you can't use them, you know, you, it's a bit of a problem. You know, there are other effective treatments, but maybe not as good. Uh, so uh, the, um, the, the, the treatment for, no, definitely will change if the ejection fraction is low. But again, to go back to your question, the patient already has a history of coronary disease. Those patients will have definitely a full workup, not only the echocardium, they'll have a stress test also, and they will... Um, be followed very closely and we'll make triple sure that risk factors are well controlled, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, of course, they really cannot smoke uh, if they're gonna get chemotherapy. Thank you, doctor. And, and we were, uh, there's a question that was cut off uh, from Sophia Tom Thomas. It basically said, I have thyroid disease for 11 years, now I, and it got cut off. So please resend your question. Next question is uh, by Christine. So, Tarot Harry, monitoring of the progression via echo of the left ventricular strain should be often, or how much is too often or often? Uh, symptomatic monitoring is not enough? Uh, that's an excellent question. The, 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 the second question is the easy one. Yeah, symptomatic monitoring is absolutely not enough because many patients have no symptoms. And they develop severe cardiomyopathies. And of course, you need to treat those immediately. So yeah, just, just symptomatic follow-up is not enough. Now, the first question is a bit more complicated. How often is often enough? Well, it depends on the protocol and it depends on the chemotherapy agent. Like I said, all the adriamycin-based uh, protocols will have an echo at the beginning. You no, know? uh, usually for breast cancer, for breast cancer will be you know, four cycles that include adriamycin. So after the fourth cycle, we'll do another echo and then six to 12 months after that last cycle, we'll repeat another echo. So most adriamycin patients will get three echoes, okay? Now, if they develop symptoms and suddenly they have overt congestive heart failure, of course, 
the protocol is off and you do an echo right there. But in terms of asymptomatic patients, there will be a beginning, end, and six months after. With Herceptin-based protocols, it's different. Because like I said, the Herceptin cardiotoxicity can be idiosyncratic. It can happen after one dose, after two doses, it can happen at the very end. It can happen at any point during the treatment. So they will get an echocardiogram every other dose of Herceptin. You know? uh, and uh, like I said, mo most of these protocols are 12 cycles that include Herceptin, at least at the beginning for TCHB. You know? So that would be at least six echoes right there. And then many patients uh, require long-term Herceptin for up to a year after the TCHP. So um, you can imagine that's a lot of echocardiograms, uh, but that's what the protocols call for, that every other cycle of Herceptin, you need an echocardiogram. So it can be a lot of echoes when you use Herceptin. Um, sometimes, you know, if the patient has decreased strain or the ejection fraction starts going down, you wanna do the echoes more often after every cycle sometimes. Now, here's a part where, is, where the, the, the world of paleontology really helps the oncologist is sometimes these, these treatments you know, has widespread disease, for instance, and they're responding beautifully to the therapy. Uh, the meds are gone. The tumor, the primary tumor is reduced you know, dramatically. Uh, you really wanna continue the chemotherapy, but the latest echo shows that the ejection fraction has gone down a little bit. Well, no, this is a patient you can reassess from the cardiology point of view. And um, if you, you know, have the blood pressure well controlled and they're on the right medications, you can tell the oncologist, listen, go ahead and give it. And we'll just keep a very close eye because again, sometimes they really need this chemotherapy. And um, for a mildly decreased ejection fraction, you don't want to withhold therapy for that. So, no, sometimes the ejection fraction can go down to 50% or maybe 45%. And we will tell the oncologist, listen, this is a bit off protocol, but this is so important for this patient that you can go ahead and we're going to be monitoring this patient much more closely by you know, clinical evaluations and echocardiograms. So that's, that's the long answer. The, the frequency depends on the protocol. And yes, you have to do the echoes because it, it can be asymptomatic. In fact, I would say the majority of the patients uh, that develop a cardiotoxicity are asymptomatic. And the ones that have symptoms is because they have developed fulminant severe cardiotoxicity ejection fractions in the 20% range. Thank you, doctor. Uh, we have a question from Vanessa Ucles uh, from Costa Rica who sends her good afternoons and good afternoon back to you, uh, Vanessa. Do you include your, in your team physical therapist rehabilitation uh, physicians and how important is exercise for these patients? Yeah, well, the, the, the importance of exercise cannot be overemphasized. Um, really is, is the number one tool we have for the prevention of cardiotoxicity. And of course, everybody knows for those patients that finally develop, if, if they develop cardiotoxicity, no, and we're talking three to 4% of patients will develop cardiotoxicity. Um, for those patients, it's even more important as a secondary prevention, the, the continued physical activity. Now, sadly, right now, uh, physical therapy is not covered by insurance plans in terms of uh, management of chemotherapy patients, but that is going to change very soon. That is actually being proposed right now, almost as we speak, to Centers for Medicare um, uh, Management because the studies are pretty overwhelming and we're pretty sure that the insurance plans will have to cover you know, a, a organized form of physical therapy. Like patients have had no, no heart attacks in the past. You know, we have a, an extensive cardiac rehabilitation unit here at Baptist. And we foresee that this is gonna be a covered service very, very soon. Patients undergoing chemotherapy to keep them active and of course, it's not just a gym, a rehabilitation service. They measure the blood pressure, the pulse, they give dietary and medication recommendations. It's a complete service. So it's not happening right now, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen very soon. 
Doctor, we have a uh, question from Sophia Thomas, who sends her hellos from Turks and Caicos Islands and the beautiful Fantastic. beaches. Uh, I have, she finished her question, which is, I have thyroid disease for 11 years. I've recently gone through chemo, right breast mastectomy, and now doing radiation. How is thyroid plus these cancer treatments affect my heart? That's, that's an excellent question. And it can, it can affect it in many ways. You know? um, first of all, you know, uh, it's well known that hypothyroidism when it's severe can produce a, a you know, card cardiotoxicity itself. It can produce a, a dec decrease in the ejection fraction. So you really want your thyroid and your T4 normals to be really, really well controlled. The TSH has to be within the normal range. Um, and then the other, no, so the, the chemotherapies themselves usually don't affect the thyroid, at least for breast cancer. The thyroid is far enough from the radiation beam. It's usually not affected by radiation. Um, and the chemotherapies, like I said, don't affect the thyroid gland that much. The only other form where the thyroid gland can be affected is if the patient develops like a cardiotoxicity and a cardiomyopathy and develops atrial fibrillation that needs to be started on, on the amiodarone. And as you know, amiodarone has a very high iodine content and it can affect the function of the thyroid gland. So um, that would be probably the only other time. So as long as your thyroid disease is well controlled and your T4 numbers are stable and TSH numbers are stable and within the normal range, there should be no major issues with your chemotherapy, no radiation, but you really need to have it like really well controlled. That's very important. I'm on mute. Um, doctor, we have another question. It says, if a patient's undergoing chemotherapy, develops an abnormal heart valve function, would this challenge uh, or cause their chemotherapy to be suspended? So abnormal what type of function? Uh, the, uh, the heart valve. If the heart valve has been- Valve function, uh, yeah. Yes. Well, the abnormal valve function usually will not happen during the course of chemotherapy. Uh, like I mentioned, Aortic stenosis can occur, but very late after radiation therapy. And the only patients that would develop valve issues would be those that develop a severe cardiomyopathy uh, that thankfully are very, very rare that, that develop severe cardiomyopathy. But if they do and the ventricle dilates, those patients will have mitral insufficiency. So by definition, those patients are not candidates for any cardiotoxic medication. Um, so yes, it, it could affect, but it, 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 would, it can produce valve disease in an indirect way. No, only if the ventricle is dilated because it's very weak and then you have secondary mitral insufficiency. But otherwise, valve function itself is not that commonly affected by chemotherapy or radiation. A quick question, doctor. You all do so much at that amazing institute that we see over your right and left shoulder. Yeah. Um, with everything that you do, with the tabbers that you all do, with the, uh, mm -hmm. the stenting, thank you for showing it off for me. Um, yeah. The, the, you know, what is with all the stents and, and you all are always a, a state of the art and part of the future stents and in every studies that, that, they, that they bring about on the cardiac side, what, what have you found as far as the chemotherapies and radiation therapies affecting the job that you all do and a lot of the, uh, the nuances in, in, in cardiac uh, endovascular work that you all do. Have you seen any kind of uh, effects uh, most common? Yeah, well, no, for actually for breast cancer, no, the treatments for breast cancer are usually myocardial cardiotoxicity. So no, sometimes if the patient has had other risk factors and developed severe cardiotoxicity, they will require a cardiac catheterization and some of those patients will require coronary stenting, okay? Now, uh, coronary disease is actually more common with other forms of chemotherapy for other types of cancer. Um, now, for instance, um, colon cancer. You no, know, it's very common that is used. You no, know, five a few for that, which is usually a very benign medication. It's one of the best tolerated chemotherapy agents, but in a rare occasion, it can produce a severe coronary vasospasm that requires a cardiac catheterization. And sometimes, if there's a lesion there, you need to you no, know, put a stent in there. So um, it can be an issue, but coronary disease itself, you no, know, uh, in terms of endovascular therapies, is not that that common as a secondary problem for these patients. 
What it, where it becomes a bit more dicey is in the management of patients that are undergoing cancer therapies and then develop coronary disease because they had other risk factors. Uh, they, were, they used to be smokers and they're diabetic and they're in the middle of cancer treatments and the platelet count is down to 10,000 and then they have a heart attack. So what do you do with these patients? Now, well, we tend to be very aggressive with these patients and they are taken for cardiac authorization and stenting. And we feel pretty comfortable if the platelet count is over you know, 10 to 20,000 to give them dual platelet agents. And it, they're usually well tolerated. So if the platelet count is below 10,000, that's when we're really in trouble because then bleeding complications could be very high. So the management of those patients also becomes a bit dicier. And that's another branch of cardio-oncology, if you wish, the interventional management of cancer patients that are undergoing chemotherapy. You know? uh, so yeah, it, it's mostly the management of platelets and uh, antiplatelet agents. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I've got three more questions for you, if, if you have the time. I also have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and keep, uh, and keep fluctuations with the TSH levels are always at two trying to find the right dose to level it, which takes a while. Now, I guess that was an answer to the previous person that was asking. And then you have, good afternoon, doctor. How often do you see ejection fractions less than 55 during therapy? And are there any other factors that may increase that risk other than the medication being used? Yeah, excellent question. So the overall incidence for cardiotoxicity for all of these agents, we're talking about in the 3% range. So it's not very common. Uh, and with adriamycin for breast cancer, like uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the dose of adriamycin for breast cancer tends to be a bit lower. Now, when you use adriamycin for other tumors like lymphomas, the dose is higher and the incidence of it is a bit higher then, but still not that much, maybe 5% at the most. Now, um, so the incidence is not that high. And again, um, we follow these patients very closely, and they, they, if they do develop a cardiomyopathy, cardiotoxicity, then they need to be started on the standard medications, like I mentioned already, uh, sacubitril and ARB beta blockers, SGLT receptors, and uh, spironolactone for sure. And the last question for the night, again, comes from Costa Rica for you, from uh, Carolina diaz Ceballos. Hello from Costa Rica. In the case of patients that have hypertension before starting treatment, should they follow up? Should their follow up be more intense, or is it the same on patients that do not have hypertension? No, that well, no. In terms of echocardiograms, the follow up would be the same. No, but you really want to make sure you know, that the clinical follow up, the patient visits, may be a bit more more frequent than the patient that doesn't have severe hypertension, because you really want to keep an eye on that blood pressure and make sure it's well controlled with the right medications. So. Yeah, they don't need more frequent echo monitoring unless they develop a cardiomyopathy. But as long as the blood pressure is well controlled and you're on top of it, and again, the clinical follow-up maybe is a bit more important there uh, for the management of hypertension. You really want those patients to be followed very, very closely. Make sure the blood pressure is just precisely as well controlled as you can possibly have it. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. And uh, we had a lot of great questions. And I know that Dr. Hakim will be sharing ways uh, for those that wanted to get more questions to get them to you so we can make sure to get them answered. So with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Hakim. Thank you so much, Dr. Rivas. Dr. Gomez, what a great presentation. Thank you so much for it. Thank you. And uh, to all of you for participating today for your attendance. If you have additional questions for Dr. Gomez in regards to his presentation, please feel free to email them directly to BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. That is BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We look forward to seeing you all in our next cardiac and vascular lecture series scheduled for August 4 of 2021. Thank you once again. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivas.